All right, I want to get into the Word of God tonight. We're teaching and preaching. Please share the broadcast if you would. We're teaching and preaching on the subject of rooted, and we're focusing on uh, Pentecost restored. And the reason why I wanted to do this series, number one, I just really felt prompted of the Lord. But, you know, someone had shared with me recently about a church. And I, I, when I say what I'm getting ready to say, I'm not meaning it critically, but I'm just being really honest, okay? The one thing you'll probably get from me the majority of the time is honesty, although it's edited sometimes because I just don't say everything, I think. But um, I, I, they share with me this church, and they said, this church is so amazing, and it's exploding and people are just the numbers are going through the roof and I began to watch the service and it was really good but I felt like that there was some kind of creation of mega church pastors where you know you go in and you kind of look a little maybe frumpy and a little overweight and then you go through the process and suddenly you're sculpted you've got a stylist everything is put together you look like a hipster preacher you've got perfect verbiage and language and I'm just saying to myself you know all these guys kind of look the same and sound the same and the churches are kind of the same and it's like Holy Spirit light and it began to occur to me that I believe we are at a deficit of Pentecost in America. Now, in the Eastern world, that there's an explosion of Pentecost. There are house churches and cell churches. And uh, one of my friends just preached at a church in Nigeria that seats 100,000 people, the largest seating capacity of a church in the world. And there are churches all over the Eastern part of the world exploding under the power of God. But we become, in the Western world, so prolific at watering down the Holy Spirit. And so I wanted to go back and look at this scripturally uh, because another thing I believe sometimes we're ashamed of Pentecost. I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but, you know, sometimes it's like, God, I don't want to be the one to shout when nobody else is shouting. I, I, I've had people tell me, uh, especially when God began to take me into charismatic circles. If you don't know the difference between Pentecost and charismatic, we'll get there. But when God began to take me into charismatic services and circles, I, I, I would have people say, you're just too loud. And sometimes I would say, I wish I wouldn't be loud. But the thing was, this is I did not come into preaching through seminary. Or, or a profession. I came into preaching through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The first sermon I ever preached, I was scheduled to testify. And when I began to testify, it felt like something as fire hit the top of my head and went through my body. And I began to extemporaneously and spontaneously preach. And I closed my eyes and opened them. And the altar was filled with people giving their lives to Jesus. And that was how God birthed me into the preaching ministry. I did not ask God to make Make me a preacher. And so oftentimes the devil will bully us and intimidate us and make us feel like, why are we the weird ones? But do you know that, that it was upon the back of Pentecost that Christianity exploded in America? Now I know you're joining from other nations tonight and your nation has a, its own unique history. But I'm standing here in the greater Atlanta metro and, and, and this has been a home to great Pentecostal preachers for many years. I did not know it until tonight when I was good just googling this you know if you're prophetic thank God for google amen but in studying Pentecost one of the people that I did not know about and I became aware of in the last two or three years was a, a lady and she fascinated me because she has not been written about on the level of many other people in fact she really has not gotten her just due but her name was Elder Lucy Smith and Elder Smith opened up a Pentecostal church in Chicago she opened up her church uh, in the 1920s she first started with a prayer meeting and she modeled her church after a tent meeting it was not it did not have a permanent structure and then she built in 1926 a church that she called all nations Pentecostal church in Chicago but do you know that Elder Smith she was the first uh, woman to build a church her church was the first church ever established in the city of Chicago by a woman in 1926 the building was dedicated and Elder Smith was an African 
Italian American woman born here in Georgia. She was born uh, in, in, in the Atlanta area uh, in Woodstock, Georgia, lived in Athens, and then ended up in Atlanta before moving to Chicago. She had such an impact on the city because uh, people would come by the droves and get healed in her church. Her servicers were known for the power of God. When she died, some 60,000 people came to her funeral. It was the largest funeral in the history of the city of Chicago up until that time. And I believe that we failed to understand the significance of our Pentecostal roots. Many of us, when we get around people who shun the moving of the Spirit, become intimidated. But we need to understand that much of Christianity would not be alive and well today were it not for the moving of the Holy Spirit. And people that shouted, and people that cast out demons, and people that danced, and people that praised the Lord, and people that made noise. It seems like in some churches now, if you're too loud, they want to escort you out because they only know a quiet Holy Spirit. But it was a loud Holy Spirit that came into the upper room in the book of Acts and began to make some noise. When the church gets filled with the power and the presence of God, there's a noise that comes out. Revival has a sound. The move of God has a sound. And I want to take intimidation off of you in the area of moving with God. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today for the word of God. It is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you for our Bible that we find our definition not in a magazine, not in a cultural commentary, not in a self-help book, but we find our full expression and definition in your word. You said in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So tonight, as we dig into your word, we are digging into you. I pray that you would anoint my lips of clay to speak as the oracle of God and open the ears of the hearers. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. If you have a Bible, we're going to begin in Acts chapter 2. Uh, I have a lot of notes and a lot of scriptures and not as much time. So we'll get where we get and we'll pick up next week. Acts 2. Now, obviously, this is the account, the historical account of the initial baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to fast forward. I am sure we'll come to those verses when the Holy Spirit came in the upper room. But we're going to begin in verse number 14. Uh, and I want to begin here because it speaks of the transformation that happens at Pentecost verse 14 of Acts 2 but Peter standing up with the 11 lifted up his voice and said unto them ye men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem be this known unto you and hearken unto my words for these are not drunken as you suppose if you are underliner you need to underline as you suppose seeing it is but the third hour of the day but this is that if you're underliner you need to underline this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel and it shall come to pass in the last days saith God I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy now what was happening here is they were assembled in the upper room waiting on the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting to me that Peter, who was preaching this message chosen by God, was the same Peter that said to Jesus, Jesus, no matter what these other disciples do, I will not deny you. I don't care how hot the heat gets. I don't care how bad the persecution is. I don't care what Thomas says. I don't care what anybody else says. I will not deny you. Yet it was the same Peter that would not only deny Jesus once, but three times. Now, if I was the captain of the team, I I'm not choosing Peter, but on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all flesh, God chose Peter, the same Peter that denied him three times. In fact, it was upon the resurrection of Jesus that Jesus would ask Peter, Peter, do you love me? He didn't ask him one time. He didn't ask him two times, but he asked him three times. Why did he ask him three times? I believe he was redeeming him. I believe he was saying unto him, yes, you denied 
me three times, but my grace is sufficient for you. All three times he pointed Peter back to purpose. He didn't point him back to problem. He pointed him back to purpose. The real Holy Ghost doesn't point you to problem. The real Holy Ghost points you to purpose. If your prophetic anointing only disqualifies you, you're listening to the devil. The Bible said it is the devil that is the accuser of the brethren. The real prophetic anointing speaks of solutions. The real prophetic anointing speaks of strategies. And so Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? I believe there was a measure of healing that happened the first time. But I believe the second time there was more. I believe the third time there was restoration and healing. And all three times Jesus said unto Peter, I want you to feed my sheep. Well, he really said feed my lambs and then feed my sheep. He was saying unto Peter, listen, I want you to feed my people. And on the day of Pentecost, it was Peter that was chosen, filled with the Holy Ghost. Why wasn't Peter scared at the men that had come mocking? Why wasn't Peter scared at those that were coming against the church? Because Acts 1, 8 said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. And I believe Peter had been endued with power. Yes, he was the same body, but he was different in the spirit. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you can do what you could not do. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you can go where you could not go. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you can say what you could not say. God chose Peter. I came today to Global Hub to tell some Peters, you may have fallen down. You may have messed up, but in the place of Pentecost, God pours out redemption. God takes your mess and turns it into your message. God takes your test and turns it into your testimony. Peter, now filled with the Holy Ghost, had boldness. Pentecost will turn you into another man, turn you into another woman. Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples in John and he's telling them I'm leaving you and they're mourning and they're sad because there's always this conflict and we see it today and I could go somewhere with this but it would get me in theological trouble so I won't but we see this constant struggle with how much of the kingdom is physical and how much is spiritual one of the reasons we have so many arguments in societies is because we want to brick and mortar the kingdom Jesus never built a single physical building. Jesus never established a, a physical kingdom. But it's amazing that we geographically and physically try to establish a spiritual kingdom. And so Jesus is speaking and they can't understand because all they can see is that the human Jesus is going away. But in his divinity, when he leaves, he's actually coming back stronger. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is coming to earth. They had walked with perfect theology, a man named Jesus. But now God was no longer going to be with them. God was going to be in them. They were going to have something they did not have previously and so jesus says to them in john 16 7 i tell you the truth it is expedient or profitable or valuable for you that i go away for if i go not away the comforter will not come unto you but if i depart i will send him to you you see the comforter could not come until jesus left why because jesus was the second adam there was a first adam adam was had divinity running through his veins. Adam never had a job. His job was to enjoy the presence of God. His description was to be a son of God. He was given dominion as a son, but the devil came with deception. And the devil said, if you'll worship me, if you'll give me what I want, I'll, gi I'll give you access to what God said you couldn't have. And so Adam began to do what God told him not to do. Uh, it's amazing. We always want what God says not to have. And we sometimes don't want what God says we should have. God said there's every single tree you just can't eat the one and what's the one that's speaking to Adam the one he's not supposed to eat and so Adam sends humanity into a cataclysmic fall Adam and Eve stay in the garden or in the garden rather the Bible chronicles that they died but we know that they lived on physically it was not a physical death but a spiritual death again we see the quandary of the kingdom that the kingdom is not physical it's spiritual it manifests first in the unseen and then is pulled by faith into the seen realm that's why the just shall live by faith because we see into the unseen realm people say why are you building a church in a 
pandemic because we've seen in the unseen realm. Why are you believing God and traveling when you should be locked up in your home because we've seen in the unseen realm? Why are you starting businesses when the world is shrinking back because we see in the unseen realm? Why are you doing outrageous financial things because we see in the unseen realm? The kingdom of God is unseen unless you've got natural eyes. I mean rather spiritual eyes. Unless you got born again vision. You know you can be saved but your eyes not be saved. That's the problem for a lot of us. We, we see, but we don't see. And so Jesus is the second Adam coming to do what? To tear the veil between God and man. And the Holy Ghost could not live inside of people. That's why when we ask, God, I want a sign. God, I want a sign. God, I'm fleecing you. If you want me to buy this car, have them put the interest rate real low. We are not to be led by external things. We are to be led by the Holy Ghost. Well, but in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament God didn't live in people. See, the Pentecostal experience is God lives in us. We don't go around and say, well, God, if you want me to date this person, have a butterfly fly by the head. God, if you want me to join this church, have the pastor wave at me. In the, you know, the, the, the devil will send a demonized pastor to wave at you in the parking lot and offer you a position. And you say, well, I, but I done prayed about it. Jesus said that you have not because you ask not or you ask amiss. One lady probably got up to rebuke the church and she said, y'all are in sin. The Lord said, you're in sin. The church said, all right, providence, how are we in sin? She said, you're in idolatry. The church, I got real big. She said, you ain't asking God, you're asking Amos. God said, quit asking Amos. Y'all didn't get that lame joke. You're asking a miss. You're not asking correctly. I remember one time the Holy Ghost said to me, he said, I want you to tell my people that I only answer two types of prayers. I answer prayers that are lined up with my word and prayers that are filled with faith. He said, you can scream and cry and beat the carpet, but if you don't have faith, faith doesn't please me. When we've heard the voice of God, faith is dispensed to us. And when we're not praying in line with the word of God, God can't answer our prayers. But the Holy Ghost came to live inside. Jesus said, after I leave, the comforter comes. The comforter couldn't come till Jesus left because Jesus had to go down into hell, defeat death, hell, the grave, rise up victoriously, lead all the Old Testament saints out of Abraham's bosom, triumph over the devil openly, and then hand the keys of the kingdom back to the church and raise up a new breed of Adams. That's why the Bible said Jesus was the elder brother. If he's your brother, that means you can have what he had. If he's your brother, that means you can do what he did. Why did Jesus say these works and greater will you do? Because he was giving you the Holy Spirit. He was leading leaving you the keys of the kingdom that you could terrorize the devil. We are terrorized by what we should be terrorizing. The devil ought to be upset that you're alive. Every day you get up, the devil ought to be nervous. Every day you get up, the devil ought to say, oh, my God, Kelton is up again. My God, Kalia is up again. I wish they would just stop praying. I wish they would just stop praising. I wish they would just stop speaking the word. Why? Because Jesus said the Holy Ghost is coming to live in you. In 2 Corinthians, the apostle Paul penned these words. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Through the born again experience and then the submersion. Because the word baptism means submersion. Now I know there's a group of preachers, the reformed preachers that preach against the Holy Ghost. But the devil is a liar. I love you, but I don't agree with you. I don't believe your doctrine's right. I don't believe your spirit's right. I believe there is a move of the Holy Ghost today. I don't believe God stopped speaking the moment Jesus went up. Why? Because my Bible said Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. But there is a group of preachers that preach against the baptism of the Holy Ghost and say we're adding something. Well, if we're adding something, then Paul added something. If we're adding something, then the upper room added something. If we're adding something, then Peter added something. But you see, I believe when we get submerged in the Holy Ghost, we become a living, breathing tabernacle of God's glory. This is the thing I think God's been trying to teach us during this pandemic. The church was never supposed to be a building. It was supposed to be a people. We were supposed to be carriers of the glory of God. But we became so local. We were no longer spiritual. We became, well, I got a hand. 
yeah, sister so and so. I got, and God was just knocking all our idols out from under us. He was knocking buildings out. He was knocking structures out. He was knocking people out. Why? Because he said, I want you to understand who you are. When you understand who you are, you will know whose you are. And when you know whose you are, you can do what Jesus did. You can heal the sick. You can cast out devils. You can cleanse the lepers. You can turn over the money changers tables. Why? Because you are a house of the glory of God. My job description is to house the presence of God. I'm not supposed to chase signs and wonders. Signs and wonders should be following me. There was a revival that began to happen some time ago in the rural parts of Georgia and Tennessee where people were traveling to see miracle oil. I mean, if you know, if, if, I'm not, I've seen some weird things in this series. I might tell you about some of them. And I, you could go on YouTube and find the great tent preacher A. Allen preaching one night and oil start coming out of his hands. So it's not that I have an issue with that. But I have an issue with our eyes being turned towards anything but Jesus. I think we've done it with prophecy, if I can be honest. We have a problem in our life, and the first thing we do, we don't pray. We want to do a prophet. I know people who believe they're called to do things I don't even think God ever called them to do, nor do they have the faith to do it because they never heard God call them to do it. But they got a prophetic word. There's a lady that's gone viral all over social media right now that says she's an apostle. And when asked, how did you find out you're an apostle? She said, somebody prophesied to me. Well, I'm sorry. But if Jesus didn't come and address you in that office, I don't believe you're carrying that office. Why? Because you apostles are ambassadors of one person, Jesus Christ. They're not designated as bishops. Our bishops are administrative overseers. Men can designate bishops. Men cannot designate apostles. Men can affirm apostles, but they cannot designate them. And the problem with taking an identity that you don't understand is you're going to get warfare you're not prepared for. You're going to have responsibilities you haven't matured into. It's not a graduation where you, well, I'm starting. Seems like now everybody started as a pastor. They're all either prophets or apostles. Now we have no more teachers. We have no more evangelists. We have no more intercessors. We have no, nobody wants to help anymore. Everybody just trying to help to climb the corporate ladder of the church. That's not the way it works. That's not how God set it up. But, but I believe it scares me because we don't understand who God's called us to be. And so we begin to run towards things and manifestations and, 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 and prophecies. And we're doing things because somebody prophesied to us. I never will forget a young lady that was being exalted and raised up by God in one of our churches years ago that, that she was just moving in prophetic worship leader. And, you know, I, I don't mean this mean, but, you know, some people God gave them the gift of sense and other people just didn't get it. I'm sorry, I just don't know. I mean, Lester Summerall used to say they had the spirit of dumb. I don't know if there's really a demon called dumb, but I tell you what, I've been vexed by some people that have that spirit sometimes. And she kind of had that, that, that spirit. And so uh, she began to just be used a little bit of God. And here comes somebody preaching in our church and prophesied, the Holy Ghost said, you're going to Africa. I said, oh, my God. This girl ain't ready to go to, to, to D.C., let alone Africa. I mean, those lying devils that eat her head off. And she just got obsessed. I'm going to Africa. You know, she backslid, lost her ministry and everything because of disappointment when it didn't happen in the time frame he said. You don't rearrange your life because somebody prophesied to you. People prophesy to me all the time. 90% of them, I put them on the shelf. That's a shell prophecy. That's a shell prophecy. That's a shell prophecy. Why? Because people just get stirred and start prophesying stuff to you. You better hear from God for yourself. Amen. God wants to take up a residency in the people who have yielded themselves to him. So I want to tell you about a revival. You know, the greatest known Pentecost. We have different people. I did not design this, but I did add one person. Uh, of course, you know, you can't talk about Pentecost in America without William J. Seymour. And then I wanted them to add because he was not on there. The founder of Coach Bishop Mason, because he is so prolific. He came out of the Azusa revival and then founded the largest Pentecostal church in America and the world. And out of that came the Assemblies of God as well. And so we'll talk about these 
these things. But I want to go back because that happened in the 1900s. But the first Pentecost in America happened in 1801 in Kentucky. Now, you have to understand that at this time, Kentucky was uh, the frontier territory. Now, it doesn't seem like that this way now. But the East Coast is where we know our nation began in the first colonies. And people began to migrate to the West. And so people that came through Kentucky were pioneer people. I was born and raised in California, and, and I've made this observation. You know, Californians, uh, and it's changed a lot since I was raised there, but we were the gold rush state, and we just kind of try anything. If you street preach in California, you don't people don't get mad at you religiously because people are worshiping crystals and hugging trees. And uh, I mean, they're, they're just, you know, they don't care. They'll let you do anything in California, amen? And now everybody's high, too, so they're very susceptible when you start ministering to them. I, 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 I prophesied to two teenagers in New Mexico one time. They were smoking weed, and I, I gave them a look, like, you know, a judgment look. And the Holy Ghost said to me, quit judging them and go minister to them. I said, can I prophesy to you? Well, they were high. They said, yeah, man, you can prophesy to me. I laid hands, prophesied, talked in tongues. They didn't care. They were happy, amen. And so California is a pioneering state. I've noticed that, that the East Coast has a strong apostolic anointing upon it. That's why I live on the East Coast. I tried for many years to go back west. The West has a lot of prophets, but not as many apostles because the seat of government in America is on the East Coast. And so you can find a governmental anointing. Of, I'm not saying there's not apostles out west, but it's a different territory. And so at this time in 1801, Kentucky was a place where people were traveling to go west. So when you had people in Kentucky, these were a wild people. So the title of my message tonight is The Wild Ones. There was a Presbyterian minister named Barton Stone. And Barton Stone had seen the spread of the evangelical religion, that people were getting saved. You have to think in 1801, there was not a lot of buildings and a lot of structures. I remember going to the home of Oral Roberts and a preacher asked uh, Oral, Oral, if you were preaching today, would you buy a tent? And Oral said, no, son. He said, in my day, they didn't have big buildings that could house thousands of people. So we used the tent because it was the only way you could house people. Well, the reason why there, there, there was something called a camp meeting, and a camp meeting was an outdoor meeting where there was multiple preachers. You could go over here, and there was a preacher preaching. If you didn't like them, you could walk over here, there was another preacher preaching. And all around the, the camp, there was preachers preaching, and people would come on their wagons, and they would come through these areas. And so uh, Barton Stone was a Presbyterian preacher, and he began to see this this phenomenon and he said i'm going to have a revival meeting an outdoor camp meeting in cane ridge kentucky this is outside of lexington and but i think it's funny it's in bourbon county kentucky now kentucky is interesting to me i preached there many times because there's 120 counties in kentucky I call Kentucky the upper room state. And so Cane Ridge, uh, they, they, they planned this revival. And it was estimated by the military at that time that somewhere between 20,000 to 30,000 people of all ages, cultures, and economic levels came on foot, on horseback, with wagons and tents and camping provisions. They came there, and Cane Ridge became the epicenter of revival in the burgeoning nation of America. A historical accounts say there was a fervor that broke out in Cane Ridge, that the meetings were going around the clock night and day. Uh, they, they were describing uh, that women were, were, were shaking under the power of God. Now, you got to think, in 1801, women didn't have short hair. Everybody had long hair. So the women, when the power of God was coming on them, they were shaking like this. And they, it's recorded in history that their hair was cracking like a whip. The power of God was coming upon them. What we would call Pentecostal shaking. I saw some years ago, you know, this group of people started. Now, if you preach this, I'm not coming against you being mean, but, you know, education is a good thing. And, and people started to say, well, are these people shaking? Oh, you better watch. They got a Kundalini spirit. Well, I didn't know what a Kundalini spirit was. I had to research. You know, I mean, some preachers, everything's a demon. There's chair demons, car demons, water demons, you know, phone demons. I mean, all these demons. And so... 
I had to search, and the Kundalini's are a, a group of Middle Eastern yoga people. And, and now we got Pentecostal people, spirit-filled folks, saying, if you shake, you got a Kundalini demon. The thing that's problematic is both in the Bible and in history's accounts of Pentecost, when people got baptized, the fire got, they shook. But the problem is we become intellectually Pentecostal. We have practiced and rehearsed tongues. We got practiced and rehearsed shouts. But in the Cain Ridge revival, when the power of God was coming on women, their bodies were shaking so hard, their hair was cracking like a whip. Why? Because when the Holy Ghost comes on you, it's like electricity going through you. Not every time, but sometimes. And so, you know, the people who originated that, that thought of that particular demon are non-spirit-filled people. But then the spirit-filled deliverance group jumped on that. And I'm not saying that those people don't have demons. Let me be clear. They're practicing false things. They have demons. But what I'm saying is there is no Kundalini in the Bible and we begin to now take what non-spirit-filled people use to attack spirit-filled people and attack each other with it. Well, her shoulder was twitching. I think she got that demon. Da, da, da. You need to study history. Women were cracking their hair like a whip. Not only that, but there was, there was a count of that people were being taken by great emotion. Authors of historical accounts say they were falling to the ground. Shrieking with conviction. Now, that's foreign to us because we just have laughter meetings now. Now, I'm going to talk at some point in this series about laughter because it is in the Bible. But that's all the revival. We just laugh, 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 laugh. We're getting fornicating. Laugh, 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 laugh. Lying, laugh, laugh, laugh. Churchmen, laugh, laugh, laugh. Gospel, laugh, laugh, laugh. But nobody has conviction because that's now, that's now old school. Some of these grace preachers preach the Holy Spirit doesn't convict of sin. I don't even know what translation they're using to get that. My Holy Ghost tells me when things are wrong. I don't know what kind of Holy Ghost you got. Holy Ghost 2.0. I'm still on the original version. I didn't need an update. I didn't need a system update. Why? Because it's still working for me. That oil's still working. That fire's still working. That cloud is still working. But at Cain Ridge, some of them were falling under conviction. Think about what the church would look like if we had that again today. We're having to tell folk in the pulpit. I, you know, I started preaching full time over 25 years ago. In fact, someone drew to my account. They said, you need to start having a ministerial anniversary. I don't remember the exact date, but my first full time position in ministry was in 1995. And it would have been April or May that I took that position. And when I, I remember talking to lay people who wanted to preach and saying, honey, your pants are too tight. Man, we can see things on your body we don't need to see when you're preaching. But these were lay people. Now we have people in the pulpit doing it. See, when I remember telling people about that, it was people that were unlearned. Now our leaders want to be sexy and anointed at the same time. Now our leaders are putting seductive pictures on their flyers. Come on, somebody. And, and I want to say, where is your Holy Ghost? My Holy Ghost won't let me do that kind of stuff. I don't know what version you got. But the wild ones at Cain Ridge fell under conviction. Said they would fall taken in great emotion, crying aloud in prayer for hour after hour. Singing songs, jumping up spontaneously to exhort others and to assist them. Worship continued into the week. But here's what's so interesting. This great revival of some twenty to 30,000 people in 1801 ended. Because there were so many people. And if you ever go there, you'll see. It's just, a, just that remote area. It's now you got Lexington all around it. But at that time, there was nothing there. And the horses and the cattle and everything they brought, it ate, they ate all the grass. They ate everything. This tell, And the revival stopped after one week. It sparked Pentecost that would grow in America. And then in the 1900s, uh, William J. Seymour would take it to the next level. But, but it stopped after a week because the provision ran out. And the Lord told me, he said, not only do you have to believe revival, but where there's glory, there's gold. <clears throat> You've got to have money for revival. You've got to have resources for revival. Jesus talked as much about money as many other subjects in the Bible, yet the church doesn't talk about money. Why? Because religious folk get upset about that. Amen. 
So let's talk about some of the things that, that can happen when we encounter Pentecost. We encounter the, the power of God. Uh, one of the things that happen is people fall under the power of God. It happened at Cain Ridge. In the Bible, many people fell. John fell in the presence of Jesus' glory in Revelations 1 and 17. The disciples fell in Matthew 17, 6. When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, they were looking for him and said, Who is this? He said, I am he. And you see, bam, they fell out. At the revelation of who he was, they fell. Many of the prophets of old, when they would see the Lord, they would fall. Some of them would not fall backwards. You know, uh, and now uh, when the charismatic movement, because that came many years later. When the charismatic move came, that they, they, they emphasized and they, and they had a portion of truth. Every move has a portion of truth. They emphasized the dove, the sweetness of Holy Spirit. They did not emphasize the Pentecost side of Holy Spirit, which is what the Pentecost move. They emphasized the dove. And so people learned to fall out sweet. But I remember meetings where people fell face forward. One of my good friends is from India, and his father pastored in India for years. <clears throat> he said, Ryan... He said, in my dad's church, everybody that gets saved is demon-possessed because everybody in India, there's over a million gods that the, the, the people worship. And he said, my father has every weekend all-night deliverance service, sundown to sunup. I always wanted to go to one of his all-night deliverance services, but his father went on to be with the Lord before I ever got to travel to India. But I did see plenty of demons when I traveled to India. But he said, we can't even let someone join our church without going through deliverance because they're so demonized. And it, but he said when he came to America, you guys do something different. I said, what do we do different, Ray? And he said, in India, sometimes the power of God comes up you and they fall. And we don't have a nice floor in our church. We got dirt and rocks. Sometimes their face just falls on a rock. But when they get up, they're not hurt. When the Holy Ghost knocks you down, you will not be hurt. Some folk get, oh man, I broke my shoulder. Well, you didn't fall under the power of God. Now you have to have catchers now because people will sue you. But the old school people didn't have catchers. Why? Because if you fell out, you better know God knocked you out. I've seen the power of God come on my wife and knock her, one time knock her back and knock chairs out. I, I just pray like, oh God, she either getting God or she's getting hurt, one or the other. She got up and said, are you okay? I'm fine. She didn't even know what had happened. That's falling out under the power of God. Let me give you some scriptures in Ezekiel 128. Say, like the appearance of the bow that is around the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of brightness all around, the appearance of the lightness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, what the glory of the Lord, I fell on my face. When Ezekiel, the prophet, saw the glory of the Lord, he fell on his face. He didn't say, oh, I think I'll fall. No, no, no. He saw God and boom, he fell. Why? Because there's levels of glory you can't stand. Sometimes I say, the glory is here, the glory is here. I don't really think the glory is here. I'm a level of the glory is here, but the glory, glory shows up. We're going to be on our faces. I remember preaching on the cluster anointing in Namibia, and I was preaching on it, and McGee was with me, and, say, and then the uh, Namibians who were so hungry for God, and I, I was preaching there, and I preached on the cluster, and then all of a sudden, uh, I said, let's demonstrate. And so we locked arms, and we began to, I was giving a demonstration, and, and all of a sudden, I felt the glory coming. And when the glory came, McGee started going, down. I said, oh, God, he's going down the person on the other side. If I'm either going down in the spirit or in the flesh, but I'm going, because if they both go down, and they're holding on to me I'm going and so uh, about the time my knees started buckling because they were going down the glory came on me and I fell out now I fell out but I was still a bit aware of where I was and I realized I had the mic and was leading the service and my mind was saying who's going to lead the service I'm in the ground the preacher's in the ground and then people just started singing and there was no instrument and no musicians but the drummer just started playing the drums I kid you not I began to hear instruments there were no instruments I began to hear sound 
sounds. There were no sounds. And the glory of God came in that meeting for 45 minutes or an hour. The preachers were knocked out because the glory was there. But God had church with the people. I believe when the glory of God encounters us and we fall down in the glory. Not just the anointing. Not just the power. In the glory. When we fall in the glory, we're going to get up different. We're going to get up changed. We're going to get up with a new dimension of power. We're going to get up with a new authority. We're going to get up with a new revelation. Amen. Revelation 117, I quoted, quoted him. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He fell when he saw Jesus as though he was dead. You ever seen somebody fall out and stay out? I remember revival meetings where people fell out and we were all ready to go and we were like, someone's going to have to take them, carry them. They were just gone. I believe we're going to see it again. I believe it's part of the move that God wants to bring into our churches and into our lives. Amen. In 2 Chronicles 5, when the glory of the Lord filled the house, the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. The glory filled the house and they couldn't even stand up under the weight of the glory of God. Amen. What about getting drunk in the spirit? Well, the Bible said in the book of Acts that that, that as Peter was preaching, he said, they're not drunk as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. He never said they were not drunk. The thing that caused men to think they were drunk was their behavior. They became intoxicated by the glory of God. Now, I know that some people take that to a level that, 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 that they get extreme, meaning that, you know, there are people who do certain things and manufacture certain things in that theology that may not be healthy. But the reality is there is a drunkenness in the spirit of God. And when the baptism of the Holy Ghost came in Acts chapter 2, they were not drunk as you suppose. They were drunk by the presence of the Holy Ghost. What will drunk men do? Drunk men don't feel pain. You get drunk in the Holy Ghost, you don't feel what you were feeling before you got drunk. Drunk men have a level of boldness. You ever notice when someone gets drunk, they'll fight with people they wouldn't normally fight with. They'll say things they wouldn't normally say. What was it that caused Peter to stand up and preach to that mass? He was drunk in the Holy Ghost. He didn't say they're not drunk. He said they're not drunk as you suppose. This is not a natural drunkenness. This is a spiritual drunkenness. I believe they were staggering. I believe they were trembling. I believe they were shaking. I believe the power of God was moving in their lives. They were not drunk as you suppose. What about laughter? Well, Psalms... 126 says, when the Lord turned the captivity of Zion, we were like them the dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter. Why would God cause people to laugh in the spirit? Because sometimes people are so low. They've been through so much. There's been so much trauma and pain and abuse that there's a realm in God where joy hits their spirits. And they begin to laugh under the weight of the presence of God. Said our mouths were filled with laughter. Our tongue was singing. And they said among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. He did great things. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Listen, I want to tell you there's a realm in the Holy Ghost that will cause joy reaping to hit your belly. That you've been through hell. Your family's been through crisis. You've been through trauma. You wanted to quit time after time after time again. But God will fill you with a fresh anointing and fill your mouth with laughter and you will reap in joy. I prophesy in the name of Jesus some of you are going to reap in joy one of my favorite scriptures dealing with the move of the spirit is found in Ezra now the back story is in Ezra they had built the temple of the Lord and there are many ways you can look at this because some people believe and I do believe it's accurate that the old men were weeping and crying because it was the changing of an era And I believe there's a prophetic significance to that interpretation. But I also believe there was a move of God that began to happen on that dedication. I remember some years ago, I wrote a book, uh, the the book Prayer Assault. And I wrote on different types of prayers. And one of the types of prayers I wrote about was the prayer of dedication. When I pastored, people would bring their children to me to dedicate. And I I, I would teach them. And I would say, listen, 
uh, we don't, we, you don't confer salvation. What we're doing in the baby dedication, we're not saving the baby. Because I grew up Catholic, so they believe you were water baptized. You know, that, that, that was a, like a level of salvation. And so I said, we're not saving the baby. We can't save the baby. The baby's got to come to the age of accountability and choose Jesus. But what we're doing is we're consecrating. We're recognizing this child is a gift from God, and we're returning the child to God. And we're dedicating the child to God. And so I wrote a whole section on dedication. I began to encourage our members. When you get a new house, don't just go in your new house. Dedicate your house. If you want to be deep about it, invite people over your house to have a prayer meeting and dedicate your home. You get a car, you get a brand new car, lay your hands on your car and prophesy to your car. This car is from the Lord. This car is going to carry me. Uh, this car will never have an accident. I plead the blood of Jesus bumper to bumper and side to side, front to back. The engine will work normal. Every part will work normal. Dedicate your car to the Lord. I remember some years ago when I was single. I wouldn't advise this today, but I did think about doing this the other day. I saw somebody walking and felt bad for them. When I was single and young, I didn't have a car. So I was walking to Bible college, and I told the Lord, if you give me a car, I'll dedicate it to you. I'll pick people up. I'll pick homeless people up. I'll pick people up that need a ride. I'll help people. And so I got that car, and I'd be driving down the road, and the Holy Ghost say, stop and pick that person up. Stop and pick that person up. And people would tell me, you better not do that. But I said, when the Holy Ghost tells me, now I'm not telling any of y'all to do that, okay? I don't do that much any, at all anymore. But I used to do that. I'd stop and pick them up. Why? Because I, I felt like God gave me that car. When God gave me the first home I ever bought, uh, God gave me a basement. I said, my house belongs to you. The basement was a Lestrange Hotel. We had people in living in our basement the whole time. But see, my house belonged to the Lord. Come on, somebody. When we got our first church building, we dedicated the church to the Lord. That it's not our church, it's God's church. And so I wrote in prayer with some about prayers of dedication. People don't understand, but whatever you dedicate to God and consecrate to God, God will fill it with his presence. God will fill it with his spirit. People say, what do you mean? I, I believe your home can be filled with the presence of God. I believe there can be a lingering anointing in your home that when you come in your home, you feel peace. When you come in your home, you feel joy. When you come in your home, you feel the blessing of God in your home. I believe your car can be filled with the presence of God. Listen, I believe people's clothes can get filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm not saying, let, let me get this camera. I'm not saying clothes get saved, okay, y'all? What I'm saying is anointing is stored up in cloth. I believe that clothes that men and women of God have worn can store up anointing. If a preacher that had the anointing wanted to give me a garment of clothing, I would take it. I'd take carpet from a church where God moved. I'd take a chair from a tabernacle where God moved. Why? Because the anointing can linger in that thing. Preachers ought to fight when anointed churches. We're getting rid of all our chairs. I want one for my house. Your wife said, that look ugly. Say, I don't care. It's anointed. I want that desk. I want that pulpit. I want Why? Because it's anointed. It's been where God's moved. Amen. I believe oil can be anointed. We make oil to lay hands on people and consecrate. We ought to pray over the oil. We ought to believe God. God, let a portion of your spirit go in this oil. One of the most unusual miracles I ever saw was the multiplication of a bottle of oil one time. Ezra 3, they're dedicating the temple in verse 10 to 13. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, that was the prophetic worshipers, with symbols to praise the Lord. Now I want you to notice the biblical pattern. Praise always goes ahead. Judah always went out ahead. So when they were dedicating the temple, before they did anything else, they began to praise the Lord. And the Bible said in verse 11, they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord. For he is good and his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout. I'd like you to note it said all the people. It didn't say the people who liked to shout, shouted. One of the problems we have now when we have meetings is some people only participate when they like it well I don't like that song I don't I, I'm just not a shouter I'm just not you know I'm not a prophetic I don't like when they do prophetic worship I don't understand it I would blah, 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 blah. listen let everything that had breath praise the Lord 
All you can do is breathe in and breathe out and say glory. Breathe in and breathe out and say glory. If you can't move nothing, move your toe and just say, I'm praising the Lord. Move your hands and say, I'm praising the Lord. Why? Because what will bring the presence of God is unity. They began to sing unto the Lord and shout it with a great shout. And then the Bible said many of the priests and Levites and chiefs of the fathers who were ancient men had seen the first house. When the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice and they shouted. So you had weeping and you had shouting. The Bible said the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping for the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off one of the things about Pentecostal moves and Pentecostal people I'm talking about I don't care what label you put on the stream you're in charismatic, vineyard uh, Kojic, assemblies of God, non-denominational word of faith, prophetic, apostolic you believe in the trinity you believe in Jesus only, I don't care what camp you're in, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the things you're going to experience and you're going to see is there's going to be noise when God starts to move. And I found out one of the things that upset religious people is noise. Religious people don't like noise. They want things quiet. They want things controlled. I don't like it's too loud. I don't, you know, I said, listen, nobody ever, I used to tell the people, I, I had a lot of baby boomers when I pastored in Virginia and they'd start complaining, it's too loud, it's too loud. So one day I got up and asked him. I said, you know, y'all call out some bands when you were young and some oh, the, the Rolling Stone, all oh, the Beatles. I said, did any of you ever argue with the Beatles sound then because the sound system was too loud? But now because you've gotten a little bit older and your hearing's a little bit sensitive, you're getting mad because people are praising the Lord. Get you some earplugs and just get in there and praise the Lord. Quit trying to shut everybody else up. Quit trying to dictate how loud it can be. Listen, I'm tired of going to churches where there's less energy and less excitement uh, than there is here in the Southeast United States. Some of you are in sin because when your high school and college football team plays, you suddenly become Pentecostal. But in church on Sunday morning, you are non-spirit filled. But there's a sound of Pentecost. There's a sound of the shout. There's a sound of the dance. There's a sound of the praise. And we've got to get back to unashamed worship. We've got to get back to unashamed sound. We've got to get back to unashamed praise. The issue is we've gotten so used to worship leaders doing the work for us and worship has become the warm up to preaching. So we just wait for the worship people. Get done and get out of the way. But for the glory to move, the people of God have got to praise God. They've got to worship God. They've got to glorify God. People will fill up a counseling session, but they won't praise the Lord. They won't dance. They won't shout. They won't move. People begin to shout. But you know what's interesting to me in Ezra? Ezra not everybody shouted. Some people began to weep. This is another thing. We judge the move of the spirit by, by reactions. Well, you know, he's just sitting there weeping. Well, the Holy Ghost might be manifesting and weeping. I've been in many, many laughter meetings, and I've really only laughed in the Holy Ghost a handful of times. I've laughed because I'm watching other people, and they're funny to me what they're doing, and I'm laughing. And probably people around me think he's laughing the Holy Ghost. I'm not. I'm laughing at what the people are doing. Because you've ever seen people get drunk in the spirit. It's funny, right? But I've really only laughed myself a few times. But when the Holy Ghost comes upon me, I'll weep. I'll scream. I'll shout. I'll, I'll lay out on the floor. See, the Holy Ghost is like a diamond. There are many facets to his personality. And what we tend to do is we tend to pick the facet we like. And what happened from the wild ones in Cane Ridge and then the wild ones at Azusa Street, and we'll walk through this, is these splinters begin to come out of the spirit-filled community. And each different move had a different expression. And that's okay because the move of God is always moving and progressing. But we're living in a time now, uh, many of our evangelical spirit-filled churches are, are what I call predominantly river churches. And there is a river of God that comes out from the throne of God. That's scriptural. But the river is not always something you jump into because John 7, 37 said the river comes out of your belly. Rivers, actually. And it didn't say a river. 
The problem with many river mindsets to me, in my opinion, is that people make the river one thing. It's laughter, it's crying, it's quiet worship with meditation and complimentative prayer. But there are rivers, plural. Sometimes there's a joy river. Sometimes there's a deliverance river. Sometimes there's a healing river. I kept noticing that many people that were only river people, that didn't do deliverance, that didn't prophesy, that didn't, didn't really preach strong, that a lot of people in their gatherings had demons. Now I would be in there and the people would be slid along the Lord and say, oh, look, the glory's on. I'm like, that ain't the glory. But they would think because there's activity, it's glory. And I began to pray about it. And the Lord said to me, he said, I didn't just send a river. I also gave fire. And I put banks on the river. And he said, any, he said, he said see, I grew up, as I said earlier, in California. And we have western diamondback rattlesnakes. This is not something I know in history. I saw them. We also have a California king snake, which has the same color on it as a coral snake. And so you have to know when you're a kid growing up in California, and my dad was very outdoorsy, so I was outdoors a lot in my childhood. You have to know the difference between a, 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 a California king snake versus a, a coral snake because a coral snake is deadly. And the difference is this. Red next to black is a friend of Jack. So the red stripe is next to the black one. It's a king snake. But red next to yellow will kill a fellow. If you get a snake with red next to yellow, you got to run. But the diamondback rattlers get in rivers in California. And I know many people, I've seen many of them growing up. You go to water because California is a very dry state. You go to water in the midst of summer, there's a good chance you're going to see a snake. And so you've got to learn how to identify serpents. Serpents will swim in rivers. And the Holy Ghost began to say to me, when you just have a river, but you got no banks, which speaks of government, and you got no fire, serpents will come and swim in the waters. This is why you can't just have the river. Yes, there is a river that flows, but you also have to have the fire of God. What did John say? There's one coming after me who shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. All these different expressions of spiritual Christianity, we've tended to just camp out on one thing. My fear is it's happening now to many of us apostolically and prophetically. We made an idol out of being apostolic. We preach whole, you know, 20 weeks on being apostolic. We don't preach about Jesus. We don't preach about loving people. We preach on prophecy and prophecy and prophecy and prophecy and prophecy and prophecy. And we have terrible character. The Holy Ghost gets a hold of you. He'll deal with your character. He'll deal with how you treat people. He'll deal with how you love people. He'll deal with your worldview. That it's not a right worldview if you think, well, as long as I'm not suffering, I don't care if everyone else suffers. That's on them. That's an improper worldview. You got so many people that pray for one nation and then the other nations get bombed all to pieces. And there ain't, there ain't no calls for the church to pray for them. Then sometimes we're praying for nations, but we don't care about our neighbor. Our neighbors dying in the streets, can't pay their bills. And we're shundying and thanking God for our prosperity. And, and yet the Bible said perfect religion is to take care of the orphan and the widow. Didn't say it was to speak in tongues. Didn't say it was to prophesy. Didn't say it was to be prophetic. All of that stuff's after loving like Jesus loves. The Holy Ghost lives in you can love like Jesus loves. I remember one time there was a lady I was working with. I'm going to finish after this. And she had been uh, divorced several times. And as, uh, she, you know, I knew this about her, she also was very, very spiritual and opinionated. And I knew her life's journey, and her life's journey irritated me, vexed me, that she'd be so opinionated. Because I'm thinking, like, you've been divorced so many times. And so she mouthed off to me one day, and I just let her have it. You've been divorced this many times. You can't stay married. Uh, I wouldn't want to be married to you. Ah, bah, 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 bah. And I just let, let it rip on her. And I walked back to my office and the Holy Ghost said to me, I want you to go and apologize to her. I said, but God, what I said to her was right. And God said, factually it was. But the spirit in which you gave it to her was wrong. So I tried to negotiate with the Lord, and I said, but if I apologize, she's going to think she's right, God. Any justice people online or in here? You know, some of us prophetic people can be super justice, but it's amazing. We're super justice to everybody else but us. 
Well, you just better reap the benefits of your consequences. The Bible said you reap what you sow. But we don't want people to tell us that in our time of need. And so the Lord said to me, son, it's not your job to be concerned about how I deal with her. You did not handle her right, and I want you to apologize to her. And the Holy Ghost made me. But this was the thing. The Holy Ghost was training me that the same Holy Ghost that could prophesy through me needed to be able to love through me and have compassion through me. And when we get filled with the Holy Ghost and Pentecost becomes a reality for us, we don't just get the gifts of God. We should get the fruit of God. We should walk like Jesus and love like Jesus and serve like Jesus and show up like Jesus and do like Jesus and steward like Jesus and many times we formed a theology around the power of God but not the character of God but I believe there are wild ones that God is going to raise up that will be full of fire and full of power but full of love and full of character I believe there's a prophetic generation that's going to be Jesus revealers we're going to love like Jesus we're going to think like Jesus we're going to be like Jesus we're, we're going to be people of our word people of integrity when we say we'll show up we show up when we say we'll do it we'll do it we're not going to quit our job after two days because someone got on our nerves but we're going to be people of character and integrity and and we're going to carry the flame of God. I believe just as God surged through this nation in Cain Ridge, I believe God wants to raise up places of his presence again today. But he's looking for some wild ones. I hear the Lord saying tonight, will you be a wild one? Will you dream like me? Will you think like me? Will you love like me? Will you give like me? Will you go like me? Will you worship me? Will you praise me? I want to break shame off your worship, says the Lord. I want you to worship worship with no shame i want you to praise me with no shame i want you to magnify me with no shame says the lord Father, I pray that you'd raise up the wild ones in Jesus' name, just as you did it at Cain Ridge. Do it again, Lord. Raise up people of your presence. Raise up places of your presence. Raise up people with wisdom. I hear the Spirit of the Lord say, I'm raising a wise generation. I'm filling your mouth with wisdom. I'm filling your tongue with wisdom, says the Lord. Oh, Basai, I declare we will not be ashamed of Pentecost. We will not be ashamed of our roots, of our heritage, but we will be a people of the Spirit, that we are those that carry this modern expression of an ancient truth, that God, the third part of the Godhead, came to live in us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that we are carriers of the glory of God. We are carriers of signs and wonders. We are carriers of supernatural authority. We are carriers of supernatural power. We are a people of Pentecost. And I see in the realm of the Spirit the boundaries being broken. I hear the Spirit of the Lord say, I'm breaking the boundaries. He said, this is a season where the church will know no boundaries. This is a time that the expression of my kingdom will look different. This is a time when things will be unplugged, saith the Lord, that literally there won't be restriction, that people will begin to move outside of the lines and begin to move outside the construct of, of, of religious structure as it has been known. This will be a time when people will dream wildly with me and they'll build wildly with me and they'll move wildly with me said the spirit of God so father I thank you for it. I pray for the wild ones to arise in the name of Jesus and this has really been in my spirit uh, these past movements most of them out of these movements came a new generation of builders I want to say this humbly and I'm not saying it in a critical way I'm just really sharing this has been on my heart so strong that I believe oftentimes in certain circles we become good at gathering but not good at building. And what happens is people are traveling and they're going to the prophetic conferences and they're going to the, you know, apostolic conventions and they're going to these really important meetings and they're getting charged. But when they go back home, there's nowhere for them to plant themselves that looks like the conference. And building is very inconvenient, but I saw the Lord raising up a generation of wild builders in this hour. I've said it again and again and again, but I believe the way people are going to build in this hour is going to look different. 
I believe there's going to be young leaders that are going to lead four and five locations, and some of them won't even have buildings. In fact, I believe that, that having a building is going to become less relevant than it's ever been in this next move of God. That people are not going to be fixated on a location. They're going to be fixated on what God is doing through the thing. I believe people are going to be, get, be entrusted with the masteries of heaven to, to steward what I'm hearing in my spirit is mobile moves, mobile ministries, mobile hubs, mobile centers. That they're going to go from place to place and people are not going to be concerned with the structure. They're going to be concerned with the presence of God. In fact, I hear the Lord say there's going to be a continual drought of His presence in many of the mainline churches. And God said that the spirit of entertainment has taken over many of the mainline churches. And yes, I've mobilized the kingdom to go to the entertainment mountain. But I did not mobilize the kingdom to submit to the entertainment mountain. The Lord is taking people back to the place of Pentecost, back to the place of the upper room. And the Lord is downloading instructions. The Lord is downloading a uh, key geographical instructions and even those on YouTube and Facebook there are builders that you have felt this burden to build and you say I don't know where to go I don't know what to do I want to say to you help is on the way I believe God is going to begin to mobilize people that will come alongside of you and I believe there are networks and tribes and groups that are arising this hour that are not looking for your money membership but they're looking to facilitate the hand of God upon your life and many builders that have felt isolated and abandoned the Lord says, I'm going to cause the synergy of the builders to begin to arise in this hour. And I'm going to cause people to begin to align through a common quest to build these innovative structures of my presence, saith the Lord. So, Father, we say yes tonight in Jesus' name. We say yes.